This is Nightmare in Wisconsin. The trial of Taylor Shabisness. Accusations of first-degree intentional homicide, strangulation, mutilation, dismemberment, and necrophilia. We bring you raw, unfiltered courtroom audio from the trial of Taylor Shabisness. Nightmare in Wisconsin. We are prepared now to undertake the second day of testimony. As you recall, we were in the middle of a witness uh, last evening, and that's what we're going to take up. So I'll turn the case over to uh, Mr. Lizea. Are you going to be taking this witness? Yes, Your Honor. And the state was done with questioning, but I believe that Detective Scanlon is now available for cross-examination. I'm going to step up here, and we're going to re-administer the oath. Uh, Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in the matter, now before the court, so help you God? Yes, ma'am, I do. Please have a seat and state your name for the record. Philip Scanlon. Your Honor, thank you. Morning, Detective Scanlon. Good morning. Um, you were called in on February 23rd of 2022 to uh, assist in the investigation of a homicide that had occurred uh, overnight on that particular date. I was. And you were briefed that there was a 911 call from 829 Stony Brook Lane. Is that correct? That's correct. And what was the report? Uh, there was report that a homeowner was calling the police from that address uh, that they had found their son's head in the bucket. And it was where was that? 829 Stony Brook. But I mean, what part of the house? In the basement. And then what did you do after you got the call? I responded to the scene. I'm sorry, I responded to the station, um, met with uh, supervisors, got briefed, and was sent to the address. What time did you get to that address? Uh, just before 6.30. In the morning? Yes, sir. And what did you do initially? I initially got there, uh, met with the le detective lieutenant on scene that was there, met with a couple sergeants that were in the address, um, did a walkthrough of the address. Um, shortly after being there, I did a quick neighborhood canvas, and then as time progressed, the warrant was signed, and then we waited for the doctor to arrive, and then we started to process the basement. In the uh, driveway, uh, were there cars parked? There was two cars. What kind of cars, you know? There was a red Jetta parked closer to the garage, and there was, a, I think, a dark RAV4. Were they parked by the side door? Yes. Did you see any gold... Uh, Colored minivan there? I did not. How many cars were parked in the driveway? I recall two. What was the other car? I'm sorry? What was, what was the other vehicle? You said a Jetta? Right? There was a Jetta and I think a RAV4, if I remember correctly. Okay. Did you see a Forester, a Subaru Forester parked there? I don't I don't recall that. Okay. Your Honor, can I approach? You may. Detective Scanlon, I show you what's remarked as exhibit 66, 67, 68, 69. Can you tell me what picture uh, 68 or exhibit 68 is? Do you say 68? Yeah, yes. Uh, 68 is a photograph of the Red Jet, I believe. Is that parked in the driveway of 829 Stony Brook? It is. Is there a plate number on it? I can't see it in this photograph. Okay. Does it depict the uh, the house on Stony Brook Lane as well? I believe so, yes. The vehicles that you saw on the date of uh, February 23rd, 2022, were uh, parked in a line, sort of, on the driveway, I'm behind each other? Yes, the Jetta was in front, and the second vehicle was behind it. And that was the RAV4? I believe so. Okay. Uh, does Exhibit 68 appear to be the vehicles that you saw when you walked up? Yeah, based on my recollection, there was a snow-covered red Jetta parked closer to the, to the garage. Okay. Then turn your attention to Exhibit 69, please. What is that? Uh, that appears to be a picture of it uh, from, the, from the trunk and license plate. Different angle of the Jetta? Yes, sir. Okay. Any other vehicles in that picture? No. Same location? Yes. Exhibit 70? 
Exhibit 70, could you look at that one? I have 67, I'm sorry, I have 66 or 69. Okay, take a look at 66. Um, what do you see in that picture? I see the a picture facing the driver's side of the Red Jetta as it's parked in front of the side door of 829 Stony Brook and then the dark vehicle behind it. Okay. Do you know if that dark vehicle behind it belonged to Steve Hendricks? I, I personally didn't check the registrations of these cars, so I, I don't know. Okay. But that's at, uh, that shows the Stony Brook Lane property, correct? Yes. Okay. And then the other exhibit, is that exhibit 67? I have it. Okay. Could you describe what you see there? It's a picture from the front end of the Jetta facing west, so it's the vantage is down the driveway with the house on the left and the two vehicles. The uh, Jetta, did you determine that to be Tara Pakenich's vehicle? I didn't run registration, so I don't know. Okay. But it's a, just another view of the of the vehicle, correct? That's correct. Uh, all of these pictures, appear, do they appear to be the vehicles that you saw when you came to this residence on February 23rd? They do. Okay. Offer exhibits uh, 67, or 66, 67, 68, 69. Any objection? No. Those be received. As part of your investigation, you did not find any uh, gold-colored minivan at this residence, correct? I did not. Okay. Did you see any uh, minivan on the street at all? I did not. Okay. Um, when you came to this residence, you walked inside and then you waited for the search warrant to be obtained, correct? Yeah, I got there shortly after 6.30. I did a walkthrough, um, looked around, um, got my bearings in the house to make type of house, uh, kind of what the scope of the search would be. We did spend some time looking um, for Mr. Therian, um, and then we decided to wait for a search warrant before we uh, proceeded, and we also had to wait for the doctor to arrive from Dane County, so we waited. Did you put on PPE gear? I'm sorry? Did you put on PPE gear, protective equipment gear? Yes. Okay. And when Dr. Trancheta arrived, then did you go down to the basement? I had been down the basement before and had come back up. So when Dr. Trinkata arrived and, um, yeah, then then primarily Dr. Trinkata, Ms. Schwab, myself, uh, Detective Cassie Pakala, and then the forensic specialist uh, Bailey Andre and forensic specialist uh, Sharneski then all went to process the basement, yes. Okay. You went down the basement when you got there just to mm -hmm. check it out? I did. And did you look at the bucket? I did. Okay. Uh, when you got down there, uh, were you in the PPE gear? The very first time I got there was not. Um, there's lot, the uniformed officers there that weren't in it. There was some question about whether the body was there and why it had not been found yet. Um, some question about how well we looked for it. Um, so we did do a quick look through and then came back up. Okay. Yes, without it. When you, Detective Scanlon, when you went down the stairs, did you see a towel over the bucket? By the time I got there, it was already removed and off the side. Laying on the on the floor? Yes. <clears throat> you looked in the bucket, obviously? I did. Okay. Um, did you move the contents of the bucket? No. Okay. Um, there were other items in the bucket later on that you found out about, correct? There were. What other items were in the bucket? There was remains. Uh, two different specific types of remains that I that I observed. What kind? Uh, there was a human head. Uh, there was genitalia in the bucket. Let me stop you there. What do you mean genitalia? Uh, what I would recognize as a penis and testicles. Okay. And were they laying underneath the head? They were visible after the head was removed, yes. What else did you see? Uh, I observed a black uh, Miracle 3 kitchen blade knife that was removed. Uh, kitchen knife. Uh, I observed a yellow uh, pocket knife, I guess for best description, the uh, pocket knife with a yellow handle. Um, there was like a head of a razor, like a shaving razor blade, a uh, nail, a uh, Jolly Rancher, and there was a flesh material that the doctor just 
described as a flush material. Blood in the bucket as well? There was blood in the bucket, yes. This is all in that black bucket, correct? The black flea farm bucket, yes. Container one. What did you do next then after uh, you fully investigated the contents of the bucket? So we, we referred to four containers in the home and as just a matter of staying organized with the recovery, we went from left to right when looking at the basement. So we, we moved to container two, uh, which was the Blue Jimmy Chew bag. And then Dr. Trenkaida set it down on a blanket, sterile blanket that he had brought. And then he started to remove the contents of it in front of us to observe. Fair to say that all of you were going through this together as far as looking around and investigating certain things? Yes, we're all together at this time, yes. And in the meantime, was um, Taylor Shabizis over at the police department with Detective Groff and Detective Kemp? She was. And were you communicating with either, were you communicating with Detective uh, Kemp? By phone, or I, text? I don't remember which one I spoke to. I was I was getting phone contact from um, one of the two of them. So information was going back between officers, correct? Yes. And the focus of your investigation was the basement of Stony Brook. Is that fair? The basement, and then you know, as we found the knives, I went upstairs and tried to identify whether or not those knives had come from the kitchen. Um, so I did travel back upstairs to take a look at the knife block, and then I looked in the drawers to see if they had similar knives to the Miracle, the black pit, the black handle knife in the bucket. So I did I did go upstairs to look at that. Okay. How at many? Some point. How, there were two knives in the bucket. There were yeah. There was two knives in the bucket. The black handled kitchen knife. So I think it was a Miracle Blade three was the stamp, and then there was a yellow, um, like a pocket knife, the yellow handle pocket knife. And when you went upstairs, you didn't see any other yellow-handled pocket knives, correct? No, I've, I've seen other milk or blade three knives. There was one on the butter dish, and there was similar knives to that in the drawer. Um, but I did not. I don't know the. I don't know the source or where the yellow knife was from. And while all this was going on, uh, the um, forensic specialist Andre and Sharneski were taking pictures, correct? Yes. Did you find uh, any evidence of drug use down in that basement? I did. What did you find down there? Um, there was a methamphetamine pipe, or what I recognized to be a, a methamphetamine pipe, on the entertainment center, and there was a green gem baggie uh, with a crystal substance that I later checked out more thoroughly. Yeah, the meth pipe that you observed, where was it? It was on the entertainment center, kind of a makeshift dresser to the left of the bed. And did you find uh, drugs? Uh, there was what I believe to be drugs, yes, next to it in the gem baggie. Okay. When you say gem baggie, is that a plastic bag? Yeah, a little small, little like a one inch or an inch and a half green baggie. Do you know what, what was in the gem baggie? Um, I later field tested it for methamphetamine. I believe it was crystal methamphetamine. And where was that? That was to the right of the meth pipe. Did you find any marijuana? I did not know. Did you find any packaging for marijuana? I did not know. Could I approach your honor? You may. <laughs> 
I'll show you this more as exhibits uh, 70, 71, 72. Uh, exhibit 70, do you uh, recognize that? I do. What is it? That's the entertainment center that uh, picture depicts the methamphetamine pipe next to which the green gem bag I referred to and some other items with some with some placards that our forensic specialists put down to photograph. Is there any packaging from a company called Loom in Iron Mountain? In that picture? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is there any uh, packaging from a company called Loom, L-U-M-E, in that photo? I don't, I don't see it. Okay. This picture, Exhibit 70, uh, does it depict that entertainment center in the basement of Stony Brook Lane? Yes. Was that picture taken on or about February 23rd of 2022? It was. Okay. Exhibit 71, could you identify that? That it just appears to be the same area, but a close up of the green gem bag and no watch in front of it. That gem bag later turned out to be methamphetamine, correct? I believe so, yes. Did some of it spill out on the entertainment center? Looking at this close up photo, there is. Um, there are white specks on the entertainment center. I don't. I don't know if that's that. Um, I didn't. I didn't use it. I didn't use a narcotic wipe to see that. No, I don't know. Okay. Does that picture show that entertainment center and contents on that um, item from Stony Brook Lane on February twenty third? Yes. Okay. Could you turn your attention to Exhibit seventy two? Um, can you identify what that is? It's. Uh, the same area, it's a close-up of the gem bag. Is that the gem bag that was on top of the entertainment center on Stony Brook Lane in the basement? It appears to be, yes. You had a good, you had a chance to take a good look at that, yeah. correct? Yes. Okay. I'll offer exhibit 70, 71, 72. Any objection? No. Those be received. Um, when you did your search of the basement, did you find anybody else in the basement? Other, other, than, the remains, other than the remains of Mr. Theory, no. Okay. Did you canvass the area and make contact with neighbors? I did. Why did you do that? I had some time um, while waiting for the doctor to arrive, waiting for the warrant to get done. Um, so rather than stand there, I decided to, to do standard neighborhood canvas to talk to some neighbors to see if any of the neighbors were up last night or had observed anything that they would be relevant to the investigation. Did you get any information that was relevant? I did. What? I did. You did. What did you get? I talked to some neighbors across the street um, who told me things that they had seen. Um, I documented their information and went to the next house. Okay. Um, when you were there at 829 Stony Brook Lane, did you talk to Tara Pakenick? I did not. Did you talk to her later on? I saw her in passing later on when they went to get some personal property, but I didn't, I didn't speak to her. Was it your understanding as part of your investigation that uh, the deceased was frequently said to come and go from the residence on Stony Brook? I'm sorry? Was it your understanding that uh, the deceased was frequently said to come and go from the Stony Brook Lane property. That was object. my understanding, yes. And that he really didn't live there. I'm going to object. This is all, I'm sorry. This is all presumably hearsay. If he, knew, if he knew that information, he would have heard that from other people. Mr. Frelick, response? Um, Your Honor, I, you know, detectives gather lots of information, and uh, I believe that, uh, you know, they're trying to do their job and get information that I believe would be reliable. There'd be some indicia of reliability to it. Um, frankly, it's already in the record, uh, his answer. Um, it's in from other witnesses. Uh, so I'm not going to sustain the objection, but I'm satisfied it is hearsay. So uh, move along, Mr. Frail. Okay, thank you. Um, we heard some testimony about that Exhibit 33, that dog collar, correct? Yes. You opened it up and we we were able to see it. 
Um, that dog collar has two rings on it, correct? Yes. Do the rings, are they able to go into each other where you could pull it tight? My understanding of the dog collar is you have to pass the chain through to join the rings so that it can be used as like a, a, a pincher dog collar. One, one of the chains that was by the pub table had already been done that and was a loop. And then the, the, the chain that was on the entertainment center was not looped through. So it was just a, just a straight chain. But the, the chain that you showed us, it had two loops and you couldn't put them through each other. Is that fair? I didn't try it, but I think you passed the chain through to, to, to marry the loop of the collar. Are you saying that there would be a separate chain? That chain was as I found it. Okay. And with that chain, the, the two rings, they're not, you're not going to be able to pass them through each other. Is that fair? I, I didn't try to do it, but my understanding would be you, would, you could not. You'd have to pass the chain through to get the loop. Okay. The um, the Jimmy Choo bag, that was on top of the entertainment center? It was. And what led your attention to that? Um, there was some red tissue and blood, not blood, red, red tissue on the, on the zipper and on the side of the bag. Okay. And inside the uh, Jimmy Choo bag were different body parts, correct? They were. There was a lung? The doctor identified the object as a lung, yes. Piece of liver? He identified a liver. Patella tendon? The doctor showed me that and identified that. Pieces of skin or fatty tissue? Yes, sir. And there are lots of bags in there, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. The, there was a pink and black Under Armour backpack that was found, correct? Yes, that we referred to as Container 3. Okay. That was on the floor by the uh, mattress? Yes, it was at the, I guess I'll call it the foot of the bed, but it was, at the, it was off the end of the bed between the bed and the entertainment center. And in this uh, container three were plastic shopping bags, correct? There was. There were some body parts in there? There was. Skin, fatty tissue, muscle? Yes. Left lung? A left lung, correct? I, I don't recall. I, it's very likely, yes. Okay. Pelvis? Judge, yes. I, I'm going to object. I just, I don't know the relevance of asking the specific questions about this. I frankly think it's unsensitive to the crime victims who are present. I don't know that it assists the jury in any way uh, to go through the specific body parts that are located in each of these containers. Well, my client is um, charged with mutilation of a corpse, so I think the state's got to prove up their, their case and I think the jury just needs to hear um, whatever information is out there. Um, I, I think it's relevant, but I can move on. Well, I'm going to find that it's really duplicative because to the extent you believe it's relevant to the state in making their case, um, you've already gone into it. So uh, I'm satisfied that we need to move on. I'm going to sustain the objection. Did you find any uh, any notes or journals on the entertainment center? There was a bag on the entertainment center that had some journals in it, yes. Uh, did it have anybody's name in there? My recollection is that when we kind of wiped through it, it, was, it appeared to be just at face value that they were probably Mr. Therian's writings. Was it confirmed? I know we, we collected them and in the event we needed to look through them later, but we didn't. Um, I know that yesterday you testified about the shower. Uh, did you take a look at the shower drains? I did. Did you find hair in the shower? I'm sorry. Did you find hair in the shower? There was, yeah, there was hair in the drain and at the floor drain. Uh, 
was it your understanding that um, Mr. Stephen Hendricks and Tara Pakinich and Ava Wheelock all used that shower, including Mr. Therian? I don't know who used the shower. Okay. Now, you um, also searched uh, a Chrysler minivan, correct? I was present for the search, yes. That was at the Green Bay Police Department Evidence Storage Facility, correct? That's correct. Was that a gold town and country Chrysler minivan? It was. Uh, were you present during the entire search? I was in. I was present for when the search warrant was executed, when remains were found. I turned my focus to the doctor who examined the remains. I was not particularly focused on the continuation of the search for small items that would have been found inside the car, like registration and things that were under the seat. I didn't pay attention to that. Did you pay attention to anything that was in the glove box as to who the owner of the minivan was? I'm, I'm aware that the owner who the minivan was, but I didn't see the registration. Okay. The owner of the minivan was Scott Thomas, correct? Yes. And inside his minivan was this uh, crock pot box that you were talking about yesterday? Yes, sir. And there were human remains found in the crock pot box, correct? There were. And in that box, uh, that box was situated in a um, laundry uh, basket, correct? Yeah, the crockpot box was on top of the laundry basket. And the laundry basket was sitting on top of a seat, correct? Yeah, the rear driver's side seat, yes. And uh, in the laundry basket were there some clothes piled up so that the crockpot box was stacked on top of the clothes? I saw something under the box, but I, I didn't itemize it, so I don't know what it was. All of the human remains were in the crockpot box, correct? Yes. And uh, in that minivan owned by Scott uh, Tomes, there was a bottle of medication for him as well? I don't know. Okay. But it was confirmed that it was his uh, minivan. Is that fair? That, that vehicle, I did run the registration myself. That was on the vehicle, and it was referred to Scott Tomes. Yes. Okay. Registered. And it was, was it true that the... Uh, the town and country minivan was towed from the Eastman Avenue apartment complex to the uh, GBPD evidence storage facility? My first interaction was that it was there, and when I arrived, it was parked there. Um, so I, I, I have a general knowledge that that's what occurred, but I didn't witness or present. I wasn't present for any of that. Okay, nothing further. Thank you. No, can you redirect? No, Your Honor. No. Okay. Thank you, Detective. You can step down. State's next witness. The state calls uh, Dr. Vincent Tranquita. Judge, is De Detective Scanlon released from his subpoena in this case? Mr. Freilich, any reason I can't release him? No objection. Uh, he's released from his subpoena. Thank you. Okay, doctor, if you want to step up here then. Um, and before you have a seat, if you could turn and face her and raise your right hand, she'll place you under oath. So help you guys. I do. Please have a seat and state your name for the record. Good morning. I'm Dr. Vincent Tranquita. My name is spelled V I N C E N T. My last name is spelled T R A N C H. I D A. Okay, then with that, the witness is yours, Mr. Lizay. Good morning, Dr. Tranquita. Can you uh, tell the jury how you are currently employed? 
Good morning. I'm currently employed as a deputy medical examiner for Dane and Rock counties of Wisconsin. And how long have you worked in the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office? I began my employment at the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office on July 1st, 2011. You are currently the deputy medical examiner there. Have you held other positions at the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office? Yes, I have. And what, uh, what other positions have you held? I was previously chief medical examiner of the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office for approximately 12 years. And uh, the decision to no longer be chief and to now be deputy, is that a, a voluntary decision on your part? That is correct. I've uh, stepped down to assist with family care. And Dr. Tranquita, what was your uh, position or employment on February 23rd of 2022? I believe at the time I was serving as a deputy medical examiner for Dane County. And what was Dane County's relationship with Brown County at that point in time? At that point in time, Brown County did not have a medical examiner's office, so we were providing coverage and assistance with forensic services for Brown County. Doctor, can you discuss briefly your educational background that is related to the position of medical examiner? Of course. I did my pre-medical school training at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I went to medical school at Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit, Michigan, where I received my MD. I specialized in anatomic and clinical pathology and did a residency at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I further went on to subspecialize in forensic pathology, and I did a fellowship in forensic pathology at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of the City of New York. I further went on to do subspecialties in forensic cardiac pathology and forensic neuropathology. I served as a senior medical examiner in New York City for approximately eight years before I went on to accept the position as chief in Dane County. So, Doctor, in total, how many years have you worked professionally as a postgraduate um, and post, I think you had fellowship as well, and a post fellowship uh, medical examiner? Approximately 20 years at this point. And what does the, what are the primary job duties of a medical examiner? As a medical examiner and as a forensic pathologist, my primary duties are to investigate the cause and manner of death in cases where there, where there is a threat to public safety. Um, oftentimes people think of this as criminal activity, but it can also refer to communicable disease, workplace deaths, or any death where there is an unexpected and unexplained uh, cause at the time of the discovery. Now you mentioned medical examiner, but also forensic pathologist. Are those two things the same? Forensic pathology is a definition of the specialty of medicine that I practice. Medical examiner is the name given to the role that I play in the community. A medical examiner is often a doctor or forensic pathologist, but not necessarily. There can be a lay medical examiner who is somebody that is appointed in the community to serve this function, and they may, for example, contract out to a forensic pathologist or to a hospital pathologist to perform their autopsies. Is it fair to say that when you were working as the Dane County Deputy Medical Examiner, Chief Medical Examiner, uh, you were essentially fulfilling both of those roles. That is correct. And if you could just go into greater detail as to what specifically you do typically in order to determine cause and manner of death. When we are notified about a death, typically it begins with somebody contacting our office. Our office is staffed 24-7, and we have investigators who are on duty uh, taking shifts. They receive the information about the call. They collect information about an individual's medical history, their social history, what medications they're on, when they were last known alive, and what are the circumstances in which they're found. At that point, the investigator will respond to the scene if needed, and then they perform an external examination of the body where they try to get as much information as they can. At that point, they notify the medical examiner or contact us and then um, sometimes we respond as well if there's a suspicion of a homicide or if a death seems very complicated. 
Through your work as the Deputy Medical Examiner in the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office, did you have involvement in investigating the cause and manner of death of Shad Theory in uh, date of birth 9797? Yes, I did. Can you tell us how you were first uh, notified of Mr. Therian's death and began your work on that case? On that case, I was notified our lead investigator on the case was Petra Schwab of Brown County. She notified our office that there was a suspected homicide in Green Bay. And as part of our policy, the medical examiner on duty responds to homicide scenes. So at that point, we mobilized and began driving up north to attend the scene of, of the investigation. Do you recall, doctor, about what time you would have arrived at the scene of the investigation on 829 Stony Brook? I cannot recall. I believe it was morning, though. Do you recall uh, who was on scene or were there other parties on scene when you arrived? Yes, there were. And uh, what, other, what types of other parties were present when you arrived? Our investigator, Petra Schwab, was present as well as law enforcement. And what did you do upon arrival? Upon arrival, typically what is done is we speak to the officer in charge and we try to get as much preliminary information as is known when we arrive at a scene. Once that information is known, we wait until there is a, a, approval for clearance and access to the body that we won't contaminate the scene or destroy any evidence on our approach. We donned Tyvek suits, gloves, masks, and face protection so that we don't contaminate the scene and also that we are protected. And then we entered the scene to do our examination of what, what's happened. Do you recall, doctor, making any of your own observations upon uh, entering the residence and then more specifically uh, upon entering the, uh, the basement area of the residence? Yes, I do. And what were those observations initially? We arrived to what appeared to be a, a typical suburban residence. Um, we entered through the front door and we were directed down to the back of the house uh, through the kitchen to a set of basement stairs. As we approached down through the base of the basement stairs, um, uh, we were notified uh, or alerted to a bucket that was present to the right of the stairs. We were then also directed that there was the possibility of additional human remains in other parts of the room as well. And I guess before we get into the specific locations of the human remains that were collected, did you make any notations uh, overall of that area of the basement where the remains were ultimately found? I did. And what were those observations? As I entered the room, I was surprised, given the preliminary information that I had, of how little blood was really very visible um, on first inspection. Subsequently, as I made my way through the room, we were able to find traces of blood uh, at various points throughout the house. I'm sorry, throughout the room, the basement. On some furniture to the left of the bed, or against the, the wall on the left, um, uh, there was a dark blue uh, bag. Um, there was also evidence of drug paraphernalia, including a glass pipe and a baggie. Um, there were also cleaning supplies, uh, Clorox wipes, and I believe a bottle of Shout uh, detergent. Adjacent to the bed was a pink and black backpack, and towards the head of the bed as well was a blue tote. On top of the bed, which was a box spring, I believe, and mattresses, were a number of crumpled uh, sheets and bedding. Doctor, I believe you mentioned uh, essentially in the room the four main uh, containers where human remains were located. Is that consistent with your recollection? That is correct within that room, yes. Okay. So we've got the, the bucket, the blue bag on top of the dresser, the pink and gray bag on the floor, and then a tote. Are those the four locations where human remains were located in the room? That is correct. And can you just briefly describe the process that was used by the medical examiner's office to collect those remains? Of course. These containers that contained the human remains were photographed as they were, or as they sat in, the, in their location. We then documented the external appearance of the containers. 
After that, um, a evidence sheet was placed out on the floor to try to collect any trace evidence that might be present either on the bag or within any of the bag's contents. I then opened each of the bag, removed the contents, and laid them out on the evidence sheet for inspection. And can you uh, describe for the jury sort of big picture uh, on a scene like this, which is, I, I presume, unusual, um, what sorts of things you are looking for, attempting to uh, ascertain as you're walking through the room and finding remains in various locations? As I go through a room and evaluate the room, I'm looking for evidence of a disturbance, a struggle, or an altercation. I'm looking for signs of biological material which may tell me where a body part may be located. I'm also looking for evidence that may have contributed to the death. In other words, instruments, objects, weapons, um, evidence of drug paraphernalia. Um, in this case in particular, I'm also looking for places that a body may be concealed or that might be evidence of movement of a body from one location to another. Doctor, you, you mentioned some of those things like uh, weapons or the instrumentality of the of the crime. Were those things noted on your investigation or observation? Yes, they were. And what was noted specifically? On a black standing table besides the bed, there was a gray metal chain. On the dresser uh, on the left wall of the basement, there was also a gray metal chain. Recovered from some of the containers as well were multiple knives, uh, some of which had a bent blade and one of which had a broken tip. Uh, specifically as it relates to the human remains that are located, as you're collecting those items, are you sort of conducting an, an inventory or um, attempting to ensure that you have everything that you need with respect to uh, the body that was uh, cut up. Yes, I am. I'm trying to recover as much of the individual as possible to try to ascertain that as much evidence as can be gained has been collected. Um, as you were going through the room, did you note that it was possible you did not have the entire body present in that room? Yes, I did. Did you note specifically what was missing? On my inventory, I believe I was missing the right thigh, specifically um, from about the waist to about the knee. I believe that I was missing as well the, I'm sorry, uh, I was also missing the left thigh and left leg. At some point in time, were you made aware that um, portions of the body may be at another location? Yes, I was. Did you travel to that other location? Yes, I did. And where was that? This was a police storage unit off-site. What did you do upon arrival there? Upon arrival to the police storage unit, I was directed towards a van or minivan that was in the storage unit. And I was told that there was a possibility that there might be additional body parts within the storage van. And did you actively participate in attempting to recover the body parts from that van? Yes, I did. My process was similar. I donned a Tyvek uh, gloves, protective mask, and a protective visor. We laid out an evidence sheet, and then we went through the contents of the van to determine if there were additional body parts. And were body parts located? Yes, they were. What did you find? I believe we recovered the right femur or leg bone of the thigh of the decedent. We also recovered a portion of left thigh, and we also recovered a portion of left leg from about the level of the knee to the ankle. And doctor, was there anything noteworthy about the parts that you recovered from the van? When they were recovered from the van, they were placed in, a, I believe, a, a crock pot box. There was evidence of skeletal trauma, including sawing, uh, chop injuries, um, uh, start and stop uh, injuries of the bone consistent with dismemberment. Uh, anything else about the, the amount of flesh that remained on those uh, items that were recovered from the van? 
Specifically, the right femur had been defleshed. In other words, the skin, soft tissues, and muscle had been removed from the bone so that it was largely stripped down to the bone itself. Doctor, I want to talk about the, the evidence recovery process and the, the chain of custody as it relates to the human remains. Can you describe what that process is? Very important in the nature of evidentiary work is maintaining a chain of custody. In other words, that the location of the remains and the custody of the remains is documented for each step along, this, along the way. At the scene, um, the, the evidence is photographed in the presence of witnesses. It is placed in a secured and sealed evidence bag. And then on the outside of the bag, we attempted to write the doc we attempted to write and document which container which pieces came from to attempt to recreate or be able to follow the story of the, of the evidence as it goes from the scene through transport all the way to the medical examiner's office. When we use a secured body bag, what we mean is it's an intact body bag that's labeled on the outside. And then we also place a security seal, which is intact and numbered. We photograph and document the seal to show that the seal is intact and that the seal that was placed at the scene is the same seal that we're cutting at the medical examiner's office. And then do you recall what specifically the process was for transporting the remains to the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office for autopsy was? Yes, I do. The transport driver was notified, the driver was mobilized, and then the driver took custody of the body bags, uh, loaded them in the van, and then the, the, the the driver and the body was escorted back to the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office. So then, Doctor, ultimately, did you perform uh, an autopsy on the remains that were recovered? Yes, I did on February 25th. And where did that take place? That took place at the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office in McFarland, Wisconsin. Do you recall who was present for that autopsy? Yes, I do. And who was that? Present for the autopsy was Brown County law enforcement and our own work technician. Yes, I can. What is that? Exhibit 73 is a copy of my curriculum vitae or resume. And does that appear to be accurate uh, as of the present date? Yes, it does. Can I have for admission of this? Any objection? Is that exhibit uh, 73? It is. No objection. Received. And then, Doctor, I would ask you to review the photographs that are depicted in 74, 75, and 76. Have you had an opportunity to review those? Yes, I have. And uh, could you just briefly describe for the jury what is depicted in uh, Exhibit 74? Would you like me to show the photograph as well? I intend to, to publish it okay. if I could. So, Exhibit 74 is a photograph of a blue gloved hand with a gray label on it. It is holding um, a blue security seal that is present around a body bag zipper. The Gray um, label reads 223433, and the blue security seal reads 0012227. Doctor, do you know uh, where that photograph would have been taken? 
This photograph was taken within the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office morgue. Does it denote the the seal and the fact that the uh, the bag that was received by the medical examiner's office remained in, intact and sealed when you received it in Dane County prior to the autopsy? That is correct. And can you describe uh, what's depicted in Exhibit 75? Exhibit 75 is another photograph taken of an outside of a body bag. A blue security seal can be visible at the lower left corner of the photograph. It also has a gray label reading 223433, which is the case number of this case. Written on the outside of the bag is sealed by PS, the initials are P and S, at sign 1506 on 02. 2322. Doctor, are you familiar with the initials PS? Yes, I am. And what is, who are those? They are our lead investigator's initial who are at the scene, Petra Schwab. And then, Doctor, can you describe what is depicted in Exhibit uh, 76? Exhibit 76 is also another photograph taken from the inside of the Dane County morgue. It depicts an opened body bag that contains four smaller containers or four smaller bags inside. Containers one through four. Yeah, and what is uh, the depiction of that particular exhibit? Is that consistent uh, with uh, your recollection of how the remains were recovered and stored when you left the Stony Brook residence? That is correct. Your Honor, I would move for admission of those exhibits and ask for permission to publish all three. The objection is 74, 75, and 76, Mr. Frelick. Yes, Your Honor, defense objects to exhibits 74, 75, 76, more prejudicial than probative, relevancy, and duplicitous arguments. Uh, overruled. And you can publish them to the jury. You're listening to True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast continuous coverage of the trial of Taylor Business Nightmare in Wisconsin. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our continuing coverage. More raw trial audio next.